All right, this uh, presentation will be a little different uh, from the preceding two. Uh, I'm a psychologist by training. Yeah, I'm here in the management division, uh, and I basically study how people make uh, decisions under risk and uncertainty. Uh, and uh, I do have a paper for you. It's a, a paper that's in, in under review right now that looks at the behavior of uh, investors, online investors at Barclays, you know, over like a year and a half period uh, during the financial crisis, and sort of follows not only their risk taking, you know, what kind of investments they make, but we also measure. Uh, intermediate variables like their perceptions of returns, their expectations of risks, and their risk attitudes in different ways. But to give you an idea about what these concepts actually mean and what they mean to a psychologist you know, who studies uh, financial decisions you know, in, in a business school, I want to give you a bit of a background about you know, sort of how, how I and, 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 and some of my colleagues and students have studied these constructs and how they deviate from the kinds of models that you heard about before. You know, so the, the, the rational economic uh, and, and finance models of risk taking and, 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 and risk itself. Okay? So I don't have to justify why we study risk and risk taking. Clearly it's very important both from a theoretical perspective and from a practical perspective. Uh, and oftentimes we try to predict people's choices and we don't, do, don't always do this well. Yeah. And so one way to think about these uh, behavioral economic uh, or behavioral finance or psychological models of risk and risk taking is to as, as, as complements to provide explanations for those situations where the economic models that by and large do a very good job at you know, sort of measuring and, and predicting what people do, but where they fall short. Yeah? And you, so you can think of, of our models, my models, as band-aids you know, on the kind of models that you typically hear about. Uh, and so they, they uh, explain other uh, phenomena at the margin. So let's start with risk. Yeah, what, what is risk? And yeah, one thing uh, we can uh, ascertain is yes, a component of risk, an uh, important component of risk, is the unpredictability of events. You know, the, the fact that oftentimes there are surprises. And there are all sorts of books about this, you know, the black swans of the world, uh, the fat tails. Uh, our models currently don't capture very well some of these uh, you know, sort of small probability events. But you know, the, the, the standard notion of, of risk, the way it's standardly uh, captured, is by dispersion. You know, the more variance there is, the more standard deviations there are around the expected value, around the mean, the more unpredictability is there is. Uh, and uh, that's great. That, that, that takes us a long way. But I'm going to show you uh, some data that show variability per se is actually not absolute. You know, if you think about you know, sort of plus or minus $100, if the expected value is $100, okay, then the variance you know, sort of goes from you know, sort of 200 to down to zero. Plus or minus $100 is, is, is a large variability on something like that. If, it's, if the expected value is a million dollars, plus or minus $100 is rounding error. Yeah? I mean, who cares about you know, that, that particular variance? But the variance itself, the standard deviation, will have exactly the same quantity. Okay? So that's sort of the, the psychological uh, or, or, or the anecdotal evidence. But I'm also going to show you that you know, sort of there's, there are other metrics, for example, the, the coefficient of variation that takes a standard deviation and standardizes it by where you are, by, by the expected value. Yeah? And that, that oftentimes predicts risk taking and the perception of risk much better. Uh, another sort of common um, deviation of risk as people perceive it, including investors, uh, is that there are other dimensions than monetary uh, returns uh, and, and, and their variability. Uh, back in the 1960s, uh, the nuclear power industry was very surprised that Americans didn't like nuclear power as a source of energy. Uh, and they put you know, several psychologists in charge to find out why it is that certain types of technologies seem to be very unacceptable and other technologies are accepted very readily. Uh, and so uh, in the process of doing so, they ab uh, abstracted what they called uh, several psychological risk dimensions. So when something goes bad, how many people will die at any given point in time? You know, the disaster potential. Uh, how much do we know about the, the particular technology? Does it seem like a well-known thing and therefore it's more acceptable? Or does it seem something that sort of is relatively unknown, therefore we dread it because we're not quite sure what might happen? Uh, you know, sort of the, the Franken, Franken foods you know, of, of this world. Uh, and so, you know, there, and, and many of these psychological risk dimensions are mediated by emotions, by feelings, of fe feeling at risk or feeling sort of vulnerable in a certain way. Uh, it turns out that some of these feelings of risk uh, 
uh, also translate to, to financial uh, situations. And again, I don't have time to talk about you know, many of these things. But it turns out when you ask the University of Chicago MBA students to sort of you know, rate a, a whole <coughs> bunch of financial investments, you ask them to do the standard kind of predictions, OK, what are your expected returns? What do you think the, the, the variability of these returns will be in the next year period? But you also ask them a bunch of questions about how do you feel about these investing investments, yeah? including dread, including disaster potential. It turns out that all of these dimensions predict how they will invest. Yeah, so in, in the next one year period. So I think sort of yeah, they're, they're not, not necessarily alternative explanations, but they're complementary explanations of risk taking. And again, these uh, uh, risk as feelings, uh, these animal spirits that Akalov and Chile have talked about over the last two years, yeah, really do predict investing behavior at the margin. Um, the other thing, and again, I won't have much time to talk about that, is that yeah, not all variability is created equal. Yeah, we care much more oftentimes about downside variability. Uh, and of course, there we can partition variability into upside, positive, and negative semivariances. And this is very much a topic that uh, Kahneman and Tversky, uh, two psychologists who won the Nobel Prize uh, for Economic Sciences in 2001, sort of have captured in their prospect theory. Uh, and again, I don't have time to talk about that, but yeah, many of these topics are covered very well in some of our courses. You know, there's a course on behavioral economics that Dan Bartels teaches and Eric uh, Schoenberg. There's a nice course now on consumer finance that Eric Johnson uh, and Steve Zeldes are teaching. And so these theories are being sort of taught you know, here. Uh, what I want to talk a little bit about uh, today is this notion of uh, variability being relative. Okay. And uh, turns out you know, in the human literature, of course, uh, in finance, we uh, talk about you know, sort of risk taking in, in terms of risk return models. The capital asset pricing model basically says your willingness to pay for a risky option X is a trade off between sort of the return that you expect to get, oftentimes uh, measured by the expected value. Okay and uh, the risk, uh, typically uh, measured by variance. And the coefficient B is just your trade-off coefficient, basically your risk, risk aversion, your risk attitude, okay? uh, that uh, determines sort of what your willingness to pay will be. And of course, expected value and variance are objective uh, components, they're just statistics, right? the first and second order moment of this distribution of possible outcomes of this risky asset. Um, turns out that there's actually something very, very similar in the animal literature. And so uh, when you look at uh, uh, the, the uh, risky foraging of animals, whether it's songbirds or bumblebees, uh, that's determined, you know, so the optimal behavior is determined by evolution. It's a different type of maximization, you know, not, not expected utility maximization, but uh, inclusive fitness maximization. Uh, and you can have these uh, very beautiful models with sensitivity theory that basically make a very similar prediction. You know, so the degree of risk taking of an animal uh, ought to be determined by the variance and expected value of the risky options. Yeah? Uh, and in the domain of gains, uh, you should be uh, risk averse. In the domain of losses, uh, you should be risk seeking because in the domain of losses, so you might actually be starving, and greater variance has a higher probability of survival. Okay. Uh, but again, for these, for these models, uh, the, the currency of risk is, has been variance, or expected uh, standard deviation or, or variance. Okay. Now, it turned out, turns out when I was thinking about you know, sort of the fact that oftentimes variability uh, uh, should be relative, and therefore the coefficient of variation might actually be a be better metric, especially in those situations where you're predicting risk taking across uh, situations where the expected value varies quite a bit. Okay. When I was thinking about these things, a colleague of mine had told me that I should sort of look up his little brother, who was an entomologist at Ohio State University, uh, who's actually studying you know, risky foraging in bumblebees. You know, and, 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 uh, so I, I, I looked up Sharoni Shafir, and he was telling me that he's just done this huge meta-analysis of all the existing animal data where songbirds, bumblebees, you know, flies of different sorts, made choices between a sure option. So if you flew to the left side of the cage, you, know, you could always be getting two milliliters of nectar. But if you went to the right side of the cage, there was a, a, a probability of a, li a larger amount or a smaller amount with different probabilities. Okay? So always a, sh a sure option, a risky option, same expected value. Okay, and of course, these normative models for predicting since the expected value was the same, the only uh, uh, determinant of their choice for the risky option should be the variance, right? And it should basically be a decreasing uh, likelihood of going to the risky option in the domain of gains and increasing likelihood in the domain of losses as a function of the variance. So he had found all data, po or data sets that had that characteristic. Uh, and when he plotted them, it was a complete mess. 
Yeah? And so there was no regularity between sort of risk taking uh, and uh, the, the, the variance of these options. But then he sort of, he's, I'm not sure why, but at some point he has this insight, why don't I try to use the uh, coefficient of variation? This just basically makes a mathematical argument for what I just said. But he said, let's plot it as a function of the coefficient of variation. And when he did that, basically we get this very, very pretty pattern. Yeah? So all of a sudden, uh, a, a graph that looked completely sort of you know, random uh, had a, a, a positive slope risk aversion in the domain of gains and risk seeking in the domain of losses as a function of the coefficient of variation. And when you just break it down into, this is again, just repeating it for the CV, uh, if you just look at the standard deviation, if you just look at the variance, there's nothing there. And so when he said that, he said, well, that's great. Why don't we just do this for the human literature? Okay, so uh, I sent my uh, grad student at the time, uh, Anne Renee Blatt, to the library, and she looked at all human uh, lab studies that had done exactly the same thing, given people a choice between a sure option. Yeah? This could be uh, money, money amounts. It could be how many human lives you can be saving uh, with different kinds of medical treatments. Uh, uh, the types of jobs that you could be getting, but, but for sure, okay? And then a two outcome lottery option, risky option, with the same expected value, uh, one outcome being higher, one outcome being lower with different probabilities, okay? Uh, and so we, we collected uh, over 200 data sets uh, and did the same analysis. We basically, now, now we have to control for more uh, more different variables because these were different types of animals, you know, people that came from different countries, uh, different cultures, uh, different outcomes on, on, on the choice sets, uh, different skewness uh, of, the, of the choices, uh, positive versus negative outcomes, and a whole bunch of other things. But the bottom line was that you know, here, again, the coefficient of variation did a very good job. Skewness also mattered, yeah, but the coefficient of variation did a very good job, and it did a much better job in those situations where it was comparable than the variance it itself. Uh, and of course, uh, that is not a new insight. You know, so the reason I was looking for the coefficient of variation is because in psychology, this is the first area of psychology was called psychophysics. You know, it's a long history of mapping external reality, uh, whether it's sort of pitch you know, or, or brightness uh, of, 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 of different uh, visual stimuli to our subjective experience. Uh, and we know that perception is very subjective you know, as a function of a species, as a function of culture. We perceive things in different ways. Different cultures perceive color in different ways, our color boundaries. Uh, but on top of that, and more pertinent to our discussion here, uh, perception also uh, is relative. It's true for value, okay, so we perceive a certain outcome, a certain monetary outcome in different ways depending on our expectations. Uh, if you inherit a, a $10,000 from some ant, is that a good outcome or is that a bad outcome? Well, it depends, right? If this is an ant you never heard of before and you just get this letter from Tasmania, $10,000 is great. But is that somebody who's been, you've been cultivating for the last five years, which is worth $5 million, you know, then $10,000 is a slap in the face. You know? So it depends on our, our, our perception, our expectations. Uh, and it turns out that also uh, the fact that perception is relative is something that is really hardwired into our neurons. Uh, and you know, sort of do, do, the, do the following thought experiment. Uh, three buckets of water, you know, one is very hot, one is very cold. I put my left hand in the hot water, my right, right hand in the ice water. And then I take them out after a minute or so, I put them in the middle bucket of tap water. Now my left hand that comes out of the hot water is gonna feel like it's on ice. The one out of the ice water is gonna feel like it's on fire, but I look down and I realize it can't be any different because it's the same water. Yeah? But our neurons detect change. Uh, and change perception then also means that you, uh, we, we detect variability in a relative fashion. Mm -hmm. uh, and so if this is true for, for these very basic uh, perceptions of temperature, it also ought to be true for variability. Uh, and there's actually a famous law, uh, ju just noticeable differences by a different Weber, unfortunately not, not even related to me. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, basically, this also is what we found in the, in the detection of, 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 of variability in the study I just described to you. So therefore, the coefficient of variation actually does a far better job in those situations where expected values differ than the variance. Okay, let me say something about, how much more time do I have, Laurie? 
So I have six more minutes. Okay, let me just say very, something very quickly about sort of risk as a feeling. So if it's true that there are all these other sort of dimensions that, have, that, that deviate from uh, the, the variability as such, uh, these sort of feelings of familiar, familiarity, these feelings of dread, these feelings of alarm, uh, how do we sort of capture them? Well, it turns out that if you are just simply ask people, you show them risky options, including risky investment options, and in this, instead of asking them what do you think sort of, you know, so the likely dispersion of returns will be next year, what's the, what's the most likely return this, this, this will yield for you next year, you can also ask them how risky do you think it is on a scale from 0 to 100, for example, or on some sort of graphic rating scale where you sort of anchor the endpoints. Turns out that these ratings of perceived riskiness oftentimes you know, sort of predict choices far better uh, than, the act than, than, than people's judgments of the expected variability. So let me just sort of show you one example of that. Uh, so we uh, had a, a, a group of uh, German MBA students uh, saw a bunch of risky investments of this sort. We basically sort of gave them uh, information about you know, sort of uh, one-year returns uh, in the past. Uh, this, some, some of them saw labels, McDonald's this case, uh, but sometimes they didn't see labels. So there were a whole bunch of variations. But one of the things we asked them for is what was the most, <coughs> most likely return for this particular investment option next year? Okay, if you invest in it. We also asked them for the dispersion. Okay. Uh, and we asked them for, for, the, for the sessions of the riskiness on this 0 to 100 scale. Uh, now, the, the question was, what did they actually invest in, yeah, in, 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 this, in this simulation? The asset chosen, this is very small, but I'm going to tell you what it says. So was the asset chosen on the left, or was it uh, uh, not chosen or chosen? Uh, up on the top one, you have their predictions for returns, and that makes sense. You know, basically, these are now standardized for below versus above <coughs> average returns. And when for those options that people thought would have lower returns, they were not chosen. Okay? And the ones that had higher returns than average were chosen. That makes sense. But here you see the graph for the uh, expected variability, the expected standard deviation. And people who, uh, for those options that were expected to have lower dispersion, okay, were not chosen. The ones that had higher dispersion were chosen. That doesn't make any sense. Okay? But when we asked them for their riskiness, the riskiness of these options, the ones that had higher riskiness than average were not chosen. The ones that had lower riskiness uh, than were chosen. So it makes sense. So in other words, the subjective expression of riskiness predicted choices far better than variability. Okay? So I don't really have time to talk about the data that we have on uh, risk attitudes. But let me, let me just sort of say in, in closing that if you take this uh, risk return model, uh, not as a finance model, but as a more psychological model of risk taking, and you sort of say, yes, people's willingness to pay is determined by what they perceive the returns to be in the future, and what they perceive the risk to be in the future, Okay. And the trade-off between those two, and the trade-off between those two is some measure of risk attitude. Do you find risk exciting and therefore you seek those options? Or do you find risk to be something that is anxiety provoking and therefore you shy away from those options? Uh, but when you now allow for the fact that perceptions of returns and perceptions of risk are actually also psychological variables that can vary between individuals, that also can vary uh, between situations that might depend on past experience, that might depend on these emotional variables. Is it something that seems familiar and therefore you know, sort of, yeah, I, I, I want to approach? Is it something that seems scary, therefore I want to shy away from it? Uh, you can actually do a, a much better job at predicting people's choices uh, that oftentimes seem inconsistent in the context of these more normative models where the only index of individual differences is this B, this trade-off coefficient. Yeah? And the bottom line is that uh, behavior that seems, uh, that seems uh, contradictory. Somebody takes a lot of risks in their financial decisions but then sort of takes no risk in their, in their recreational decisions are not really driven by differences in risk attitude in these two situations but by the perceptions of risks and benefits in different types of situations. Yeah. Uh, and it's those kinds of differences that you also see in the data uh, set that I'm going to circulate the paper on, this Barclay data set where we looked at uh, investors' uh, changes in risk taking over the course of the financial crisis. And you will find that that, that risk attitude doesn't really change over the time course uh, if you assess it correctly, but their perceptions of risk and benefits change in ways that make total sense you know, when, when you look at the external environment and how, how, how uh, uh, success and failure changed over time. But let me just close on that and thank you, Laurie.